point, do you have any? Okay. Uh, got it. Great, thanks a lot. Why don't you get rid of the uh, toolbar thing? I don't know how to do that. Let's see. Yeah, I don't know. Um, down in the bottom. Yeah, we'll I don't know. Yeah, sorry, sorry. No worries. Um, right. So GRVs, as I've just described them, are a very well established phenomenon. They were first discovered half a century ago, and many here uh, at NYU, including people in the room, uh, played a major role in developing this field, including Mario Mojas and Andrew McFadden. So at this point, about 100 GRVs are discovered every year by high energy satellites like SWIFT and Fermi. But these satellites can only localize the burst to a few square arc minutes to a few square degrees. So from just the GRB detect detection alone, you can't tell exactly where the burst came from. To do that, you have to use telescopes observing in other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum to search this localization region, identify this afterglow counterpart. Um, and that has enabled all kinds of science, uh, the measurement of the distance to these bursts, um, so I'm showing a redshift. This is a distribution of redshifts here. Uh, these GRBs are the brightest photon sources in the universe. We can see them essentially out to the other end of the universe. And so their distribution is essentially set by the cosmic star formation range. Um, we've also been able to do studies of GRB host galaxies. And at this point, there's a general consensus that they have a preference for what are called low mass, sort of LMC-like, uh, low metallicity star forming galaxies. So we've learned a lot uh, in the last century about GRBs, um, in addition to their use as sort of probes of massive star evolution, which I've already touched on. Uh, they're also a lot of interest, particularly to me, um, for what they can teach us about very basic astrophysical processes. And essentially real time, you know, from seconds to hours to years, we are witnessing the formation of a compact object, the launch of this ultra relativistic jet and its propagation through matter, and then the interaction of that jet with the ambient medium, you form a shock and accelerate particles in that shock. And I'll discuss some of these processes again uh, later in my talk. That's why I think uh, GRVs are very interesting. And now I want to outline a few major outstanding questions in the field that motivate me in my research. First is the observation that GRVs are intrinsically very rare only about 0.1% of the overall core collapse supernova rate. And they only seem to come from a very special type of star. These are massive stars fully stripped of their outer hydrogen and helium envelopes. We don't really know why that should be. Second uh, is the puzzling observation that the jets uh, involved in GRBs are very clean. They entrain very little material, only about an earth mass of material, which given that these are stellar scale explosions, is really a very tiny amount. And it's also not at all clear why that should be. Third uh, is the, the sort of observational hints that the overall volumetric rate of GRBs is actually dominated by a population of what are called low luminosity GRBs. They seem to have quite different properties from the classical version, uh, but the relationship between these two populations is really not clear. So I'm not gonna talk about this puzzle today. I just don't really have time, um, but I'm happy to later uh, in the Q&A if you're interested. For now, I want to just focus on this uh, puzzle and to tell you more about what's called the dirty fireball hypothesis. This is a very old hypothesis, um, and the idea is that GRBs, as we observe them with our high energy satellites, are just the tip of the iceberg. They're actually the extreme case, and most uh, relativistic jets are actually much more uh, mass loaded. So I'll illustrate that with this cartoon. This is just a cartoon version of the animation I showed earlier. This jet is launched by this compact object. It you know, breaks out through the star. If the initial Lorentz factor of this material is hundreds or thousands, you can produce gamma rays. And you see those as a GRB if you just happen to be observing directly on axis. But in order to get to such high velocities, the jet has to be extremely clean. If it entrains just a bit more material, 
it'll only achieve Lorentz factors of a few. You won't get any gamma rays at all. So these will be missed entirely by our GRB satellites. You might get a sort of X-ray flash. Um, and on axis, that's what we call the sort of dirty fireball picture. Now, the idea is that sort of all else being equal, by the time the jet uh, decelerates enough to produce the optical afterglow, dirty fireballs should look essentially the same as clean ones. And so a simple way to test this hypothesis is to go out and look for the optical afterglows and just check how many of those happen to have associated GRBs. And so this hypothesis is correct. There should be a huge population of afterglows out there that have no associated detected GRB. What was the origin and how old was this hypothesis? Um, the late 90s, early 2000s. Some sort of seminal papers were written on this. Any thing. particular people associated with it? Yeah, I guess you can't see on the bottom here. A Dermer, along with Jason uh, Rhodes, uh, wrote a lot of these papers. So that's really uh, what I set out to do using the Zwicky Transient Facility, which is an optical time domain survey. Um, this is an outline of the rest of my talk. And I'm going to start by just giving you a brief overview of ZTF, how it works, how we use it to find uh, cosmic explosions. The idea with ZTF is to discover uh, cosmic explosions and characterize them on a sort of industrial scale. Um, ZTF uses three different telescopes that are at Palomar Observatory in Southern California. We use the 48 inch, the smallest one, to actually discover the transients. And we use the bigger telescopes, the 60 inch and 200 inch, to, uh, to characterize them. So we do this in a very systematic way. I've been involved in a few of these large scale efforts. Uh, we've been classifying all transients that are bright as well as all transients that are nearby. This is 1 64th of a real ZTF image. It has an enormous field of view of 47 square degrees. Shown here compared to various other uh, optical transient surveys. And that's really one of its key strengths and what makes it particularly well suited to the work that I've been doing. So, in practice on a given night, ZTF will take images of the sky as part of several different surveys down to a limiting magnitude of around 20.5. Um, at the moment, we're doing the entire night sky every two nights in G band and R band, and then a smaller area of the sky at about 5,000 square degrees multiple times per night. The process of taking images and identifying explosions is fully automated. Um, so it, on a given night, you'll take an image, you will subtract it from what's called a reference image. So just an image of what the sky normally looks like at that particular location. And then every difference, uh, in our case, every five sigma difference is registered as an alert. And just to give you a sense, the full time from the close of the shutter following an image to the availability of one of these alerts uh, is about eight minutes. So I wanted to make this more concrete for you. Uh, so I grabbed all the data from Saturday night, which was our last decent night of observing. The weather has actually been terrible over the last couple of weeks. Um, and here's what we observed. There are about 400,000 alerts. That's pretty typical. That's a pretty good night with CTF. Of those, there are about 330,000 unique sources. Of those, I would estimate that about 140,000 are true astrophysical sources. And of those, I think, only about 900 are good candidates for being supernovae. I say only, that's really a lot of supernovae. Uh, but as you can see, there's a huge amount of whittling down that's required. And to do this, I apply really uh, very basic cuts. Um, Anna, Anna, can I interrupt for a second? <laughs> yeah, uh, David's uh, <laughs> Josh voice. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, uh, I have two questions. What are the what are the majority of alerts that are not astrophysical? Is my first question. My second question is: do, Is do you guys use a very special um, subtraction algorithm, or is it like a, one of the standard subtraction algorithms? Uh, right. So the subtraction algorithm is called Zogi, um, developed by a group at Weizmann, uh, including Iran Ofek. Um, and then a lot of the fake things are uh, just artifacts from the subtraction. So every alert that's generated is assigned a uh, machine learning based neural network based score that tells you how likely it is to be real. And so part of how I got that number was just to get rid of all the ones that had a bad score. I see. So you actually deliver the score in real time. Yes, that's actually part of what takes the eight minutes is to, it was actually the calibration, the subtraction, but then for every 
uh, for every alert, it gets a bunch of contextual information. Part of that is the machine learning based score, but then also cross matching with a variety of catalogs like Panstars and Wise and so on. Okay, good. Thanks. That answers my questions. Yeah. So, if we could go back. so similarly, yeah. um, so you said, you know, they're astrophysical and then they're supernova. What, what is the, you know, 10 to yeah, the I can three? Say, I can tell you, I can tell you what I actually did. Uh, um, the 10 to the three, you know, astrophysical, but not supernova. Yeah. So another big, so, players? um, so when, to go from the 330 K to the 140 K, I got rid of uh, sort of artifacts from subtraction, things we believe aren't real. There, there are actually a lot of problems close to very bright stars. Um, and so a lot of those, some of the, a lot of those are masked automatically, but then there are always things left over. I also got rid of things that have an extremely short duration. Some of those could be astrophysical, but at the moment we have no good way of distinguishing truly short, you know, single detection astrophysical sources from something like a satellite glint. Those can also look like very fast transients. And so at the moment, uh, unfortunately, we essentially just have to throw all those things out. So I threw all those things out. I threw out things that are associated with known asteroids. Those also look like very short duration transients. Um, so that's how I got from the 330K to the 140K. And then as for supernovae, I got rid of everything associated with something classified as a star. I'm not interested in you know, stellar variability. I threw out all the AGN. Um, I threw out things with extremely long durations, which is a good way to get rid of some of these stars and AGN. I mean, there could be some supernovae there, but that would be a very small fraction of them. So it's not, uh, doesn't affect this significantly. So everything left over here is sort of, you know, it, it's long enough, long enough in duration that we believe it is real, the real astrophysical source, you know, has good machine learning uh, score from this, this subtraction quality is good. Uh, it's not associated with a known star, and uh, that's about it. Most of the things left are usually supernovae. Yes, a uh, question about the reference image. How do you get that, and how are you sure that when you get the subtraction, it wasn't from the reference? Yeah, this is a whole other issue. Okay. So, I mean, basically, the first year of ZTF, we spent a lot of time just taking images to make reference images. Um, and I think it's actually, you know, it would be better if one could use images that have already been taken by other surveys because you waste a lot of, you spend a lot of time doing this. But as it, as it is, the way we do it is for the first part of the survey, you just go and you take, you repeatedly image the sky and you stack, uh, I think it's about 20 images used to make a reference and you do a sort of median stack so that you get rid of transients. Um, there are issues where sometimes a transient was in the reference, um, but we flag, we have a way of flagging that. And then you can take images later to kind of properly do the subtraction. So as a, at the moment, we do it as part of the survey. What was the time cut from something that you threw away because it was too fast? Too fast, I use about 20 minutes. That's just from experience. Um, oh, that, experience. Yeah, asteroids, given how quickly they move, especially when they're close to the stationary point, you can detect them again um, over the time span of a few minutes. So this is ETF's intra-night cadence, right? When you have multiple pictures. Not all of these. This is just a given night of data. And so the data was obtained from many different surveys. Okay. Some of many of most of it would be from the public so from the two-day cadence okay. Okay. survey. Only a small fraction of this would be the high cadence survey. And also I'm including all the stellar Milky Way. There's also Milky Way observations. <clears throat> Any other questions about the inner workings of ETF? Oh, okay. not, uh, that brings me, that actually ties in nicely to my next topic, which is how I go about sifting through all of this to find uh, GRB afterglows. So this is a very uh, technically challenging problem. People have been trying to do this for a long time. Uh, it's challenging for several reasons. Uh, the first reason is that these are intrinsically rare events. So I just told you on a given night, we might detect hundreds of supernovae. Well, ZTF will only detect an afterglow uh, once every few months. It's also hard because afterglows are very fleeting, short-lived events. Um, these are powered by optically thin synchrotron radiation, so they fade significantly over the time scale of just a few hours. Uh, so this is the light curve of an example afterglow as detected by ZTF's predecessor, PTF, which Mariam was involved in. Um, so this was detected at around 18th magnitude and then faded below ZTF's detection threshold within just four hours. In contrast, uh, supernovae last much longer. The physical mechanism there is very different. Uh, the time scale is set by the diffusion time for photons through optically thick ejecta. So these are completely different physical processes. 
And the third reason it's hard is because to do the science, you don't want to just detect it in your optical survey. You want to identify it in real time so that you can get a spectrograph and measure the redshift so you can get your X-ray and radio telescope and measure the afterglow in other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum because that's what you need to do the modeling. So as I mentioned, people have been trying to do this for a long time. There's a history of searching optical time domain data for these kinds of extragalactic fast transients. These previous searches collided with this huge foreground of primarily stellar flares. Um, stellar flares can look, can involve on very similar timescales to afterglows, particularly flares from M-dwarfs and flares from uh, cataclysmic variables. So I've been developing ways over the last few years to sort of pierce this fog of false positives. Um, one strategy, which unfortunately I found that at the detection threshold of ZTF, typically when you detect an M-dwarf flare, you can also identify the M-dwarf itself in sort of sufficiently deep uh, archival imaging. And another useful strategy is to use the color. Uh, afterglows are synchrotron radiation, which in GNR band look pretty red, whereas stellar flares are power or thermal and therefore appear blue. So that's turned out to be a very important way to, uh, to discriminate between these different kinds of transients. I mean, ZTF is missing, but it has two filters. Exactly, right? GNR. It only has one. Yep. Yeah, it, and that's turned out to be essential, actually. We'd be in big trouble um, without that. So that's the strategy. Um, I, as I mentioned, I set up to do this from the beginning of ZTF, which had first light in March of 2018. And now the rest of my talk follows my own personal experience, which is that first I'm going to take you on a very long detour. And then at the end of my talk, I will come back and finally answer uh, this longstanding question. So what happened was that uh, three months after I started looking for afterglows, the Atlas survey, another optical transient survey, found a quite spectacular transient very nearby. And this had been named just by coincidence of 2018 COW, and so everyone immediately began calling this the cow. Was it spherical? <laughs> uh, so this is a figure just illustrating why this was of such interest to the supernova and transient community. Um, on the x-axis, I'm showing the rise time of the optical emission from 1 to 100 days, and on the y-axis, the peak luminosity in ergs per second. And these different color points correspond to just various different uh, established classes of supernovae. These black points on the upper left correspond to what Mariam was talking about in the introduction. Uh, they're often referred to in the literature as fast blue optical transients. That's really just a catch-all term to, uh, to say that we don't know what they are. Uh, most of them were found in archival searches of optical survey data, and so it was essentially too late to get the follow-up observations you need to figure out what they are. But 18 cal was way up on the upper left, um, so clearly sort of in this part of parameter space. And so uh, there's a lot of interest in studying this nearby uh, young event and getting sort of general insight into what could be going on in the upper left-hand part of parameter space. Just to give you some sort of intuition for why this is an interesting area, you can draw a line roughly here on this diagram where the events on the lower right uh, can be powered by the conventional supernova mechanism, which is radioactive decay, whereas the ones on the upper left uh, really cannot. And so you need other, perhaps more exotic powering mechanisms um, to describe these objects. So I thought that this was a GRB. Um, there were early reports of observations of very broad spectroscopic features from high velocity material and also luminous X-ray emission that is characteristic of a relativistic explosion. And so I immediately triggered radio follow-up observations. As a spoiler, it did not turn to turn out to not be a GRB, it turned out to be something uh, completely different. But since I'll be talking about uh, radio wavelength data, I wanted to start by giving you a primer on what we normally expect to see from cosmic explosions and supernovae so that you can better appreciate why what we did see was so, uh, so unusual. So basically, when you have a, an explosion, you uh, launch a shock wave, you accelerate electrons and amplify magnetic fields, and you get synchrotron radiation. This is the single electron spectrum. In practice, you're observing a huge population of electrons. And the assumption that is conventionally made is that these electrons follow a power law distribution and energy down to some minimum, uh, minimum Lorentz factor. 
to integrate over this uh, population, and you get a net observed spectrum, which looks like a broken power law uh, on the, uh, so this is the sort of net power law of nu to the minus alpha. And then there's a critical frequency, which is where the plasma becomes optically thick to itself. It's called the synchrotron self-absorption frequency. Uh, the spectrum turns over, and you get this characteristic uh, nu to the five halves power law. So we see this all over astrophysics. You see it in supernova remnants, you see it in radio galaxies, and you see it in supernovae. Now, usually the way these observations are done is with a radio telescope, like the Very Large Array, which I'm showing a picture of here. That's me posing as Jodie Foster, I don't know if anyone's seen contact. Um, <laughs> so the VLA observes from frequencies from about one to 50 gigahertz. Uh, so that's what I'm showing here uh, on this left-hand panel. And so at early times, this is just a, an example of a supernova. The top panel shows what the spectrum looks like three weeks after the explosion. And you can see that at the VLA bands, you're basically just sampling the optically thick part of the SED. Whereas at later times, by about a year after the explosion, you're fully sampling uh, the whole shape. So if you imagine observing at a single observing frequency, say about uh, one gigahertz, at early times, you won't see anything because the emission is completely self-absorbed. But over time, the SED shifts down in both flux and frequency. So your light curve goes up. And when this critical frequency passes through your observing band, the light curve turns over and comes back down. That's what I'm showing here on the right. This is a collage of uh, single frequency light curves for about one to a thousand days, uh, observed mostly with the VLA of various different cosmic explosions. You can see it spans many orders of magnitude. Um, but zooming into this particular event is one of these blue curves. You can see, uh, as I was telling you, it sort of goes up and then turns over and comes back down. So this is the sort of standard, uh, this is what we basically always see when we observe supernovae with radio telescopes. Um, what you actually want to do physically to do the science is you want to measure the frequency and flux of the synchrotron self-absorption peak for reasons I'll explain later. That's how you infer basic properties of the explosion and also of its environment. But obviously, at early times, you can't do this because the peak is too high frequency. And so you need to uh, turn to a different type of telescope. Uh, these are telescopes observing, oops, here we are, telescopes observing at what are called submillimeter wavelengths uh, or very high frequencies. But it's been much less common to be able to do this uh, for both technical and astrophysical reasons. Technical reasons are that these millimeter telescopes used to be far less sensitive than radio telescopes like the VLA. And then astrophysically, emission at high frequencies of 100 gigahertz fades very quickly. So this is now just one to 100 days. And you can see that just in the first 10 days, the emission fades, uh, fades very significantly. So the success rate for detections has historically been low. But the situation is very different today uh, we have new, so very sensitive millimeter band uh, observatories like ALMA, and ALMA uh, has been extensively used for observations of GRBs in particular to study a phenomenon called the reverse shock, and it's also starting to be used for the earliest stages of supernovae to study the sort of innermost circumstellar material, uh, which corresponds to the final stages of stellar evolution. So I couldn't know for 18 cal where the SED peak would be. And so I triggered a variety of facilities observing at many different frequencies from about five gigahertz all the way up to uh, many hundreds of gigahertz with ALMA. And what we saw uh, was really quite spectacular. So this is the 230 gigahertz light curve uh, of 18 cal as observed by uh, a telescope called the SMA. This is a picture that I took uh, shortly before COVID, it was actually one of my last uh, trips before everything shut down. And the peak of the SED persisted at very high frequencies for weeks, which is really uh, quite different from normal supernovae. This is a plot showing the spectrum at two different epochs, uh, once uh, about 10 days after the explosion, and then again uh, at around 20 days. And you can see that at 20 days, we beautifully resolved the peak of the SED um, using all that. So then the question was, uh, this is, oh right, actually one more thing I wanted to mention um, is that at about 10 days, we have this extremely steep optically thin spectral index of about minus two. Uh, this is far steeper actually than normal supernovae. Normally they're about minus 0.1 to minus one. Um, and so I've had this in the back of my mind for a long time that we saw this weird behavior 
And I'll come back to that uh, a little later. Oh, yes. Uh, I wondered how easy it is to map that back to the energies of the electron, you know, the frequency. Oh, right. Or do you need to know magnetic field model? Or yeah, let me get back to that. I'm going to actually kind of talk about that okay. later. Yeah, you, you can you can estimate that. Um, right. So we have the peak of the SED. Um, it's at 100 gigahertz for weeks. This is completely different from normal supernovae. And so then the question is, why is this event so special? So another way to ask that question is with this uh, kind of classic diagram from radio supernova astronomy. On the x-axis, you put the time of the observation times the peak frequency of that SED. And on the y-axis, you put the peak radio luminosity. So these are various sort of well-studied uh, supernovae or sometimes GRBs. And 18 cal was way up here on the upper right. So observationally, a way to ask this question is, what does it mean to be on the upper right-hand side uh, of this diagram. So to answer that, I'll go back to this uh, synchrotron SED. At any given time, the uh, flux, the peak flux and peak frequency of this self-absorption peak uh, is essentially set by the radius of the shock and the magnetic field strength. And so you can uh, you measure the radius and you assume that the velocity has been constant. You can estimate the this mean velocity up until that time. Uh, by assuming that momentum is conserved across the shock front, you can get an estimate of the ambient density, which corresponds to the rate at which the progenitor star lost its mass. For the magnetic field strength, you have to make an assumption about what fraction of energy goes into magnetic fields, uh, but then you can get an estimate of the total amount of energy that's been converted by the shock. And so now here are the uh, x and y axes of that diagram that I just showed you. So going back. Uh, oops, there, going back here, time times frequency and peak luminosity. And so on this diagram, uh, lines of constant velocity, uh, you can draw lines of constant velocity. 18 cow had a shock speed of about 0.1 C, which you know is kind of fast, but certainly not unprecedented. On this diagram, uh, lines of CSM density or mass loss rate show up as nearly vertical. And so clearly a big part of the story here is that the environment was very dense. And then the y-axis of this diagram uh, turns out to be directly proportional to the efficiency at which energy is converted by the shock, which itself is also uh, related to the density. So this was a very energetic explosion that took place in a very dense medium. And that's essentially uh, the information that we get from these millimeter and radio observations. So many other people um, all over the world uh, conducted observations of this object all across the electromagnetic spectrum. What I've just described to you is just one piece. Um, I don't have time to sort of do justice to all this data, but I wanted to just summarize some of the essential differences between this new type of object from gamma ray bursts. So whereas in uh, classical GRBs, the central engine remains shrouded from the observer, in the cow, it seems like we're actually able to see down to it that manifests itself in very luminous and rapidly varying X-ray emission. <laughs> GRBs are always hydrogen and helium poor. They come from the special type of progenitor. Whereas in the cow, we saw hydrogen and helium. Uh, so this is clearly a very different type of massive star. GRBs have associated with them uh, a very bright nickel-powered supernova that lasts for weeks. Whereas in the cow, most of the time, it seems like we're seeing a very fast optical transient followed by nothing. So no kind of conventional supernova. Um, at the moment, it seems like the most likely powering mechanism for this optical flash is shock interaction with very dense and optically thick material surrounding the star. Then finally, whereas GRBs typically explode in a fairly low density environment, it seems like these cows uh, have a very high ambient density, a very different kind of mass loss history, and that's why we have this very different radio and millimeter behavior. Right, and then uh, the host galaxies are actually very similar. So they seem to prefer these kinds of dwarf star forming galaxies. And that suggests that they do have something in common in terms of how these massive stars uh, evolve. Okay, so that was the cow. Um, the next step was obviously to try to find more of these things, and I'll also talk about the uh, energy of the electrons. So I started to look for these with CTF, 
Um, and it turns out that this problem is actually even harder than this already very hard problem of finding afterglows. You would think this would be easier because although afterglows last for only hours, these cows last for a few days. Um, afterglows are typically found at huge redshifts of cosmological distances, whereas for these cows, we typically find them at around redshift of 0.1 to 0.3. But the problem is really the color. So I mentioned that afterglows are red because they're synchrotron radiation. Uh, these cows are actually thermal radiation, so they're blue, and that makes it really hard to distinguish them from the most common types of false positives. And so in this case, what I'm finding is that we have to sort of systematically, spectroscopically classify quite a lot of transients before we get to find any more of these cows. So that's what uh, I started doing um, a couple of years ago. And what this amounted to was essentially the first uh, systematic spectroscopic exploration of the day time scale transient sky. And I've learned a number of interesting things. One of them is that this traditional sort of f bot parameter space is dominated by established classes of core collapse supernovae. Uh, for those who know supernova types, those are type 1bn and type 2bs. Um, and this has also led to the discovery of two transients similar to 18 cow itself. Uh, we nicknamed them after their ZTF name. So one of them is called the koala and the other is called the camel. There have also been two other uh, similar transients found, one in Catalina Sky Survey data, and then actually one by Erosita, the X-ray satellite. And I'm working on this object with a graduate student, uh, Yuhan Yao. Uh, from my searches, I've uh, determined that these cows are intrinsically extremely rare, so they can't exceed about 0.1% of the core collapse supernova rate, which is very similar to the rate of GRVs. One of these objects, uh, the camel, was interesting because it was the only event since 18 cow that we identified within just days of the explosion, which let us conduct another sort of systematic multi-wavelength observing campaign. So it triggered again a variety of telescopes observing at millimeter and radio wavelengths uh, for, for about 100 days. Uh, one of the telescopes I used is called Noema. It's an interferometer in the French Alps. And this is a spectacular uh, camel light curve. So it's uh, exceedingly luminous. It's, you know, rivals. It's basically as luminous as a gamma ray burst. And uh, it also had another uh, sort of interesting property that I'll show you now. So this is the evolving uh, radio to a millimeter SED. So play. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. This is the evolving millimeter to radio SED. It evolved in basically two stages. The first stage starts now. The peak is around 100 gigahertz for about a month, similar to 18 cow. And then now it starts to cascade down in flux and in frequency. This is extremely odd behavior. This is very different from normal supernovae. But what really caught my eye and got me excited uh, was this observation here. So this is an extremely steep optically thin spectral index. Uh, again, it's close to about minus two. Whereas the normal thing for radio supernovae is minus 0.5 to minus one. And I mentioned this earlier because we saw that in 18 cal. It's something that's always bothered me about this object. Uh, but now that we're seeing it again, it seems like the time to figure out uh, what was actually causing this. So uh, to figure out where this was coming from, I looked for other kinds of objects in the literature that have shown this behavior. So one type uh, is, was seen in an ultra long duration GRB. It had a very steep spectrum uh, inferred from radio observations. And the hypothesis is that it actually corresponds to a very steep, a sort of intrinsically steep electron energy distribution. And another class of objects are actually not stellar explosions at all, uh, but AGN. So there are a number of AGN that are called steep spectrum sources. They're very steep radio spectra. And the idea here is that you have something that looks actually kind of like a GRB. It's a compact object launching a jet, but just on a far larger scale. But here, the interpretation is that if the engine is not steady, if it turns off, then all your electrons uh, can cool, and you can basically get arbitrarily steep, uh, steep spectra. So I have looked into both of these. I won't talk about the one on the right, because I just don't have time. Uh, but I'll focus on this idea on the left, that somehow what we're actually seeing is an intrinsically steep electron energy distribution. So in modeling supernovae, I mentioned earlier that the conventional assumption is that all of the electrons, 100%, are accelerated into a power law, down to some minimum Lorentz factor or minimum electron energy. And this corresponds to the sort of power law index of this electron energy distribution, 
gives you your observed uh, optically thin spectral index. They're related in a certain way. And that's why you expect the spectral index to be about 0.5 to 1. But it's actually far more natural to expect, and it has been shown in simulation that you should expect that only a small fraction of the electrons are accelerated into this power law tail. And actually, most of them stay in this thermal distribution. And so the function for this, it's called a relativistic Maxwellian for the, you know, assuming the electrons are actually at relativistic speeds. And this very naturally gives you a far steeper spectrum. So it's actually an exponential uh, in frequency, not a power law. So people have speculated that you might be able to see this in a few different contexts, particularly GRB afterglows and Sagittarius A star. Sagittarius A star actually also has a strange uh, millimeter wavelength bump. Um, but as far as I know, no one has ever invoked this for, uh, no one has ever actually applied this to data taken for a cosmic explosion. And so what I found is that it actually beautifully describes the data better than the power law electron distribution assumption. Um, I've taken data from these three 18 cow like objects, the camel, the cow, and the CSS transient. And what you're seeing is that on the optically thick end, it's actually new squared, not new to the five halves because it's a thermal distribution, not a non-thermal distribution. And you get a very steep cutoff at high frequencies because it's an exponential, not a power law. And uh, with this assumption, you get very reasonable shock properties, sort of mildly relativistic speeds, high ambient densities, um, actually somewhat similar to the properties you infer from the power law assumption. And then you can also infer, uh, I think someone's asking about the Lorentz factor of the electrons, was that the question? And yeah, yeah this gives you uh, also the Lorentz factor. So you can just take the frequency here and say, you know, the frequency of the electrons emitting at this peak, you go from the frequency and then it's gamma squared EV over MC and you get a, a Lorentz factor of about 20, I think. So I think uh, that we're seeing thermal electrons actually uh, in this class of explosions. But then obviously the question is, well, why uh, we've been observing supernovae with radio telescopes for so many years, why did we never see this before? And there's actually a very natural explanation for this, uh, which is that the combination of properties in these events uh, is quite unusual. You have two things, you, know, you have a high shock speed, so mildly relativistic, kind of 0.1 to 0.5 C, and you have a very high ambient density uh, and from work that, uh, that Margulet and Elliot Quadrat have been doing, uh, it turns out that it's actually the speed that is the most important in determining the relative strength of these thermal and non-thermal components, um, but also the density. And this determines not just the relative strength, but also the frequency at which you see this bump, which has to fall within your observing band. So this uh, sort of interesting picture is coming together where it all supernovae, the bump is there, but it's, but it's only in this particular class of events with the fast speeds and the high densities where it's directly observable. Yes. And how much role does the magnetic field play? Um, how much role in? Well, it has to bend the electron to make the, to the synchrotron radiation. Yeah, that's, the, that, that's, the, that's directly related to the density. It's the same. And that's essentially, it's very similar. Well, density determines the magnetic field. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, when I say density, that's basically what I mean. Okay. It's interesting for supernova because with you know, the high density you have in type two ends, but you don't have the relativistic speeds. Exactly, exactly. Right? And then you have the relativistic speeds and you brought up that one since exactly. you have the high density. Exactly. Yep. So for GRBs, we're finding that this thermal signature would probably be at hundreds of megahertz, and that's not really where we're observing. Um, that's really interesting because it means that we can actually directly uh, oh right. So actually a few other events that do have this combination, very few. Um, but I've been looking at the data carefully, and I think the problem here is that they didn't have observations in the right frequency band um, to really see this uh, to really see this signature. But it's not; it shouldn't just be events uh, like 18 cow that do this. There seem to be other classes as well. Uh, right, but if what we're really seeing are thermal electrons, then that's extremely interesting because it means we can set a completely new constraint on what fraction of electrons are accelerated by the shock. And so the way you do this is you take this cartoon and you look for this transition where you go from the thermal component to the power law component. And then we can say that in these events, we don't seem to be seeing this transition clearly. So we assume we're in this part. That gives us a constraint on where this could be. And for the camel in particular, that's telling us that uh, at most 20% of the electrons are being accelerated. So this usual assumption that it's 100% uh, is really not correct. <laughs> 
All right, so uh, I think that uh, these millimeter observations have turned out to be extremely interesting. And before I circle back and talk about the afterglows, I just want to say a few words about prospects in the next decade or so for millimeter band time domain astronomy. So in the work that I've been talking about so far, uh, and which you know, I'll continue to do in the next few years, the strategy is that you discover the transients uh, in the optical band, and then you use ALMA and OEMA to conduct follow-up observations to measure the millimeter emission. So this has a number of limitations. You're biased towards only following up the transients that you believe are worth following up. And then the resources for this kind of work, like ALMA, are extremely limited. But fortunately, it's something I'm really looking forward to, that maybe you heard about last week in Colin Hill's uh, talk, is that we're now entering this era where we can find transients blindly using millimeter telescopes. And so in April, um, I organized uh, this workshop on millimeter transient surveys, bringing in people from the different, uh, different cosmological, different um, CMB experiments to sort of summarize where we're at in looking for millimeter transients. And I want to share with you uh, what I learned from that. So this is a uh, this is a phase space that's commonly used in radio uh, transient surveys to compare the capabilities uh, of different surveys. On the x axis, you plot the flux density or the sensitivity of the survey, and on the y axis, the number of sources in the sky brighter than that sensitivity threshold. And then you can plot uh, tracks, which just correspond to the sort of theoretical rates for different classes of explosions. So a few years ago, we had the very first uh, blind search for millimeter transients using the South Pole Telescope. Uh, they found one transient, and that gives you uh, a constraint uh, right here. Just this year, uh, they conducted, they expanded their search to cover a much larger area. They found 15 transients, of which two were extragalactic. Uh, so we can put that uh, on this plot here. And they now have a, 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 an alert stream online, so they're announcing when they find a new transient, which is enabling us to do, uh, to do follow up. The Atacama Cosmology Telescope has been surveying 40% of the sky weekly for the last few years. Um, they haven't finished a systematic search of their data, and so I'm just showing this as a sort of upper limit wedge here. What I'm really excited about is CMBS-4, uh, the kind of next generation millimeter transient survey. Uh, I'm the co-chair of their new transients working group. And the idea is that you get much better sensitivity over a much wider area. And so you're pushing down uh, right onto these tracks and we can expect them to regularly detect extragalactic sources uh, from the rates uh, in my work so far. I think they'll find a few transients like 18 tower every year, uh, as well as GRB afterglows. So this is very exciting um, and but also very surprising. I wasn't really expecting to, uh, to take this detour. Um, and now I want to go back and talk about this search for optical afterglows. So just to uh, reorient you, since we've kind of wandered a long way, uh, there's been this long-standing problem to find afterglows outside the gamma ray band. Uh, people have tried this at radio wavelengths, but the problem is that the discoveries uh, typically come years after the explosion, so it's hard to do the follow-up observations uh, that you want to do. At X-ray and optical wavelengths, there's this big problem of being confounded by stellar flares. But it was clear even before ZTF that this was technically feasible. Uh, there had been three serendipitous discoveries of afterglows in the optical band, two of which turned out to be ordinary GRBs. What I was trying to do in my work was make this not serendipitous, but to make this very deliberate. And uh, in January 2020, uh, I finally found my first afterglow with ZTF. So this was something that looked in every respect like a GRB afterglow at a redshift of 2.9, but it had no associated detected GRB. I'll walk you through the timeline of our discovery and follow up uh, in days on the x axis since the estimated time of the explosion and it's basically brightness on the y axis. So it was discovered with VTF uh, at 19.5 mag and even just from this first observation I knew basically immediately what this was. Uh, it was red colors like synchrotron radiation. It had brightened extremely quickly, faster than normal supernovae, and it had no associated star. So immediately triggered follow-up imaging uh, with Liverpool telescope, the 200 inch, just confirmed that it was fading very quickly. Um, I slept for the entire night in the Keck observing room at Caltech. Uh, this is a picture of my sleeping bag. I took this to kind of commemorate this uh, character building experience. And actually the person who I, so when you do this kind of observations, 
you have to interrupt somebody's observing program. And so I had to TOO them at you know, 4 a.m. And the person I TOO'd actually wrote some of the seminal papers on the dirty fireball hypothesis by coincidence. That was Rhodes. And so we actually had a nice chat about that. And I think he was quite happy to be, uh, to be interrupted. So anyway, I got a spectrum with Keck, and that's how I measured the redshift of 2.9, detected the X-ray and radio afterglows with Swift and the VLA, and that was it. So all of the detections we ever got from this event were within 10 days of the discovery. Um, and that's an illustration of why this kind of work uh, is technically difficult. But after this, uh, after this point, it started to work very well. Um, today, we find about one afterglow every two months with CTF uh, for a total of about 10 so far. I'm showing uh, here on the upper left are the few events, uh, four of them, which had no associated detected GRB. Uh, these things are sometimes called orphan afterglows because they lack an associated parent GRB. But this is very surprising, actually. So of the 10 objects, uh, looking back in the data, six turned out to actually have a fairly ordinary GRB. So what does that mean? It means that the rate of optical afterglows uh, does not exceed the rate of GRBs. And that basically says that this hypothesis that there should be you know, many dirty fireballs out there um, cannot be correct. So, or I guess there's two possibilities. Either it's just not correct, and these clean jets are somehow fundamental to the phenomenon, or they're out there and they just look different from what we expected. Perhaps these jets get disrupted as they get through the star and they don't result in a sort of successful, uh, a, yeah, in a successful relativistic uh, jet. So the main limitation now in trying to actually settle this question is the fact that when we find these optical afterglows, we almost never know, uh, we have no information about the high energy uh, counterpart in the X-rays. Um, as I said, you expect dirty fireballs to also have an X-ray flash. And so uh, I'm looking forward to the launch next year of this X-ray satellite called SVOM. This will be by far the most sensitive wide field X-ray survey that we've ever had. And so uh, we're working with the SVOM team and DTF to uh, get sort of joint observations, which I think is what's needed now uh, to really definitively answer this question. But we are finding some orphan afterglows. So the question is, what are they if they're not dirty fireballs? So some might be GRBs that were just missed. High energy satellites don't have fully complete coverage. Uh, and sometimes their sensitivity isn't sufficient to detect all bursts. But I think it must be that some of the ones that we're finding are GRBs observed very slightly off axis. Um, and here's why I think that. So when you're observing a GRB, um, the, let's see, there we go you're actually only observing a very small area of the jet. Um, the emission is relativistically beamed, and so the area that you see is only one over this Lorentz factor, which for GRBs is really uh, a large number, so you're just seeing a tiny area. But over time, the jet, the jet decelerates, uh, which means that this uh, angle that you see broadens, and so essentially, uh, if you're able to, so essentially there should be, just by this argument alone, um, a number of optical afterglows that have no associated detected GRB, because essentially you're able to probe outside this initial GRB beaming cone. And if that's correct, then we're actually seeing outside this GRB beaming cone routinely for the first time. And what I'm hoping to do now that we have a sample of these objects is try to use them to set the first constraints on the structure uh, of the jet. Okay, so that's the answer to that question. Um, and now I want to end uh, with a few words about the future and sort of where we've come so far. So at the beginning of my talk, uh, I presented a few outstanding questions in this field. I wanna give you a quick status report. So first is this mystery of GRBs are rare and only come from a certain type of stellar progenitor. But I think with the discovery of 18 cow and related objects, uh, it's turned out that you can get uh, sort of quasi-relativistic jets at least from completely different types of progenitors. We still haven't solved the question though of why this is rare. The second question about why GRB jets are so clean, um, it turns out that either this cleanliness is truly intrinsic to the phenomenon or dirty fireballs as initially predicted uh, actually look different from what we expected. And then as I said, I'll, I can talk about that later. Uh, I won't have time today. So what do we do next? Um, so what I'm trying to do with ZTF over the next couple of years, uh, ZTF phase two just began and will run until 2023 at least, is get us to the point where we're doing fully automated triggering and follow-up during the night. So we don't wait for someone like me to check the data in the morning 
because that imposes sort of unnecessary delays. To settle this dirty fireball question, I think at this point uh, we can't use our optical surveys. We need joint observations with an X-ray satellite, uh, which is also something I'm hoping to solve in the next few years. For this question about which stars uh, make relativistic jets, I'm hoping to sort of cross correlate our optical survey data with CTF with the new blind transient survey data being obtained by millimeter and radio telescopes. And then a whole new area of work that's sort of come up by surprise is this, uh, how we can use millimeter observations to constrain the particle acceleration in cosmic explosions. And I think for that, given the limitations of this follow-up strategy, uh, we really need more millimeter telescopes that are dedicated to the pursuit of, uh, of transients. And with that, um, I will leave up this emerging uh, optical landscape, showing you the various uh, objects that have come in the last few years from optical surveys, uh, summarize some of the work that I've done, and take any questions that you have. Any questions for Anna? Especially by junior members. Hi, very nice talk. Um, mine is somewhat unrelated, but related. So I wanted to ask if you expect that in the Milky Way, we would see any, just as if we, just like we see supernova remnants, would you see any gamma ray burst remnants in the Milky Way, in your opinion? Which yeah. I can almost work out by the numbers you've already listed, but. Yeah, so I think the challenge is just, you have to somehow identify it as such. Mm -hmm. um, I think people have done work to try to map some of these remnants that we see to what type of explosion, what type of star. It would have been. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, there's been no definitive link between a certain remnant and this kind of explosion. But I certainly think in principle it would be possible, but probably just hard to to tell exactly what kind of star it was. I mean, you don't even know really yeah. what type of star it was. So you need to solve that problem too to find to identify the remnant. So I think we're a few steps away from being able to to make a link like that. Um, I have a question if I can come in. Um, the, this is a question like Mariam and, and you have both heard me ask this question before, but, but one of the things that's strange to me about the gamma ray burst model is that the, the idea that the emission is beamed is, it, is very highly theoretically motivated, but not at all empirically motivated in the sense that there's no direct empirical evidence for beaming. And you might think in this afterglow, like if you take your image seriously with the yellow star and the pink cone coming out of it there yeah. should be far more fireballs right uh visible in the optical than in the gamma ray but gamma rays and you only find a few more not a lot yeah. more and and a, a bunch of mariam's results also are kind of like qualitatively like inconsistent with high beaming i'm not saying like obviously there's selection effects and so on but can you just speak to the question of whether like beaming is measurable empirically because i'm starting to think maybe it's like a theoretical fantasy yeah so i can say a bit about why we you know, the belief has been that these grbs are beamed i guess there's a couple of different things there's beaming and there's collimation so one question is are these jets and then another separate question is are, is the material moving at relativistic speeds because if it's moving at relativistic speeds, then it has to be beamed just through. This, this is relativistic beaming. So the, I guess the collimation question sounds like maybe what you were referring to. Is that right? Is this a jet? Yeah, well, actually, it's a good question. I mean, imagine you had an isotropic yeah. relativistic explosion. Yeah. Uh, you almost implied there that you would call that thing beamed. But, but I yeah. think that's slightly misstates what most astronomers have in, in mind. Do you think it's possible that, uh, because if, if, if beamed is just a synonym for relativistic, then I think we should just use the word relativistic. My question yeah. is kind of, are they collimated and yeah. is the covering factor on the sky yeah. small? Yes. So, right. So I'll, yes, I'm using, uh, you're right. I, if something's moving at relativistic speeds, I would say that it's beamed. And I think that does matter because it'll mean that the intensity of the emission you observe is higher than what you would get if it's not beamed. Um, so it affects the, yeah, it fine. Yeah, fine. Um, but, but, yeah, but you're but, right. That's just a basic, yes. So the collimation yeah. question, yes. Um, you know, there are a few arguments that have been made. A number of them are quite indirect, as you said. One would just be, well, you know, we see AGN, we can map, we can actually image AGN, and those are jets. 
And so then I think one argument is just the analogy being made to the stellar scale systems. Um, another argument is the energy requirement, which also is not, that's not observational, that's a physical bias, you could say. We think that they should be 10 to the 51 ergs because it's the, uh, the gravitational fighting energy of a neutron star. And so if you invoke beaming, you solve your big energy problem, which is that if it's isotropic, you get explosions that have you know, 10 to the 53 ergs, 10 to the 54 ergs, if it's really isotropic. Another argument, which this one is more observational, is there are expectations for what the afterglow should look like if it's a relativistic jet. Because early on, uh, when the jet is moving at relativistic speeds, it has no ability to sort of interact sideways with itself. Um, eventually, you do get to that point. And another effect is that you are looking, you know, the, the, your angle, because of beaming, is first just a small fraction of the jet. Then you see the edges of the jet. And those two effects together give you what's called a break in the afterglow, because now you should have a mission that fades faster than it would if it was truly isotropic, because you're missing, you're only seeing a small fraction of this isotropic ball with the jet, if that makes sense. And people have observed jet breaks. There is a problem that the jet breaks don't always look like what we thought they should look like. Um, they should be achromatic, if that is correct, and sometimes they're actually chromatic. So there are actually only a few cases where, as far as I know, where the jet break really looks like what it's expected to look like. But we do see the breaks um, and the art and the the explanation, the only explanation that's been presented for them, as far as I know, is this effect that you're seeing the edge of this uh, of this jet rather than an isotropic explosion. So I think the jet breaks are probably the most direct example. I mean, now we have this neutron star merger where the afterglow really is well explained by a truly off axis jet um, that is different, admittedly, from a massive star explosion. Um, but we have at least one example of a sort of cosmic explosion producing this kind of outflow. So then the problem is that I think what you're talking about is where are all the off-axis GRBs? And I think at the moment, so you know, this argument that I just made for why we're not seeing these off-axis events, one answer would be that the assumption that energy is equally distributed across the whole solid angle of the jet is wrong. And I think it's known that this cannot be correct. It's sort of cartoonish. But if the energy drops quickly from the center of the jet, that would be another natural explanation for why we're not seeing all the off-axis events. Because this beaming argument that I made only holds if this slightly off-axis viewing angle gives you an afterglow of the same luminosity. And if the energy is dropping with angle, then that, that's, not, that's not valid. Um, so that's one explanation that still allows for this jet. And then as for the lack of off-axis jets, I mean, the rates of these things are very low. So it's only, you know, they're associated, you know, it's true that as far as we know, all the GRBs have an associated special type of supernova, but even for that special type of supernova, it's only a small fraction of them that have a truly successful relativistic jet. And so I think that also explains why we're not seeing the off-axis events. You need many, many, many of them to have a good chance of detecting one, given the sensitivity of our, uh, of our radio telescopes in particular. So I don't think there's a big problem yet with the rates. Um, I think if none are found uh, by these blind radio surveys that are happening now, we'll have problems. But actually, one has already been found. One good candidate has already been found with the VLA Sky Survey. So, and the rates inferred from that are not uh, not so different from what was expected. So I don't think I don't think there's a big problem with this yet. Um, I mean, I, that was a great answer, and I, I really, really appreciate that answer. And, but I have to say, uh, first of all, if the collimation is a factor of 100, which is implicitly true in the yeah. pictures you're drawing, then, then actually a very large fraction of these supernovae actually have gamma ray bursts, because we'd only see of order a percent or sub percent as gamma ray bursts, and that is about what we see of the, this type of supernova. The other thing is that that there it feels like the community i like i like the jet break argument it's a beautiful argument but it's funny that there's so much emphasis on the jet break argument and not a lot of emphasis on producing real predictions for what the population statistics should be under yeah. realistic selection effects and i feel like that's a really big open question yeah. and and it, there could be it really it smells like there are surprises here yeah yep i agree um, I think obvious work to do now, which can really be done with all these surveys, is to revisit the rates 
because the rate's been a long time since people really sort of calculated rates of all the different types of GRBs and their associated supernovae. And we have far better constraints now. And I completely agree. I think revisiting the rates is actually something I've been, uh, been thinking about doing. Great. I would. I mean, if you want to consult, well, we'll talk about that tomorrow morning. That's a yeah. great project. Yeah. Another question back here. Yes. I guess I was just wondering about yeah how you go back from a certain number of events to a rate for the class of objects because it depends on all the detection efficiencies and so on. And right. So a huge background yeah. to reject and yep. you can lose stuff through that. And if you have these millimeter events, can you go back through the ZTF data to find them there? And does that also help you with the the uh, you know selection efficiency? See how often you find them in the optical to trigger on millimeter. Absolutely, yes. So uh, two different things I'll address. One is about the rate, say, of this part of parameter space. I think the elegant thing about this experiment is that it doesn't actually matter. You know, obviously you want to find as many of them as possible because that gives you better statistics. But say I missed half of them. The experiment is just, I find an afterglow blindly. I then go back and check if there was a GRB. And so I have this experiment where I have a number of trials to sort of say, given something that looks like an afterglow, was there a GRB or not? And so the and, and if you assume that the events sort of with and without GRBs should look the same, uh, then actually the efficiency with which you're detecting them doesn't matter in answering this particular question. Because the question is just when you detect them, when you discover them in this way, what fraction had a GRB? And I can do that for any given event, even if I'm only finding half of them. So the GRB ones were triggered in the different Well, so they weren't necessarily because another thing is that a lot of these events were GRBs that were not really pursued. You know, they were officially posted on GRB satellite pages, but because they weren't extremely well localized, they were not events that people were following up. And so I basically checked with the, I did a sort of cross match between to see, okay, given the timing and the localization region, is this consistent? So I'm, I'm sort of, you know, through this way, I'm finding the afterglow that actually had not been found for other means. Um, and then the question of the millimeter, yes. So in principle, one could do that. The problem is that the millimeter surveys that exist right now are all in the South. There's zero overlap with CTF, yeah, so I can't do that check. Problem. Yes, but you can do this check with uh, uh, other facilities. So for example, I mentioned that one of these events, uh, this one was actually identified, sorry, hand shoot me, this one, yellow one. It was actually found by an X-ray satellite. We then checked our ZTF data. It was detected in ZTF, but we had not recognized it. So that's a that that is a way for us to see. And the reason we hadn't recognized it is because it looked, it had certain characteristics and a counterpart that had been classified as a star. So it was thrown out by our thing that gets rid of stars. So this is exactly what you're what you're saying. Yeah. And so we're we will be able to do this. Um, it's just that right now we can't do it with the millimeter surveys. Right. I have a meta question. Yeah, I was wondering how you go about triggering these other surveys to follow up your objects and how who has the power to decide whether you get to take over someone else's time. Yeah, it, it varies a lot from observatory to observatory. They all have their own policy about how this kind of interruption works. For some facilities, I would say most at this point, um, at every deadline, I write a bunch of proposals to say, um, you know, here are my triggering criteria. I'd like to request three interruptions over the course of the semester. And then that's approved at the outset. And then when the thing comes up, I can just trigger. Okay. Um, there are some facilities where you know, maybe your time isn't awarded, you don't get the, propo the proposal doesn't go through, or they're not really set up to do this yet. And so then it can be uh, you have to write with a proposal for what's called director's discretionary time. You literally just write to the director and you say, hello, this thing is really important. We'll solve all the astronomy if we observe this thing. Um, can you please give me a uh, Chandra 20 kiloseconds of time or something. And then it's really up to their discretion about given their schedule, can they accommodate it? And is it important enough? Very interesting. Especially for something you couldn't have expected. They're a new thing. You can't necessarily write a proposal ahead of time. Any other questions for Anna? This is still kind of confusing to the one thing to break out of the stars. Is that why the mixed field effects are important? So this art is kind of separate now. Yeah, so that's, that's that's the question is the, the, the reason we think that these jets are clean is not because we necessarily think they should be, but because we see the GRB. And to see the GRB, you need ultra relativistic speeds for various, because basically it's, you're seeing a non-thermal spectrum 
in the gamma ray emission, which means it's optically thin. But given the uh, given the sort of amount of energy being released in the small volume, it should actually be optically thick. And you get around this by invoking a huge Lorentz factor. And so you're seeing the GRB, therefore it must be relativistic. Okay, so you're going at Lorentz factors of hundreds to accelerate material to Lorentz factors of hundreds at the sort of supernova energy scale e equals m squared. You can only have a very small amount of mass. So it's a, an argument about being able to see the gamma ray burst actually. So then you say, okay, so the jet must be clean to produce a gamma ray burst. Why would it be clean? And the hypothesis was that there's no reason for it to be clean. Therefore, most of them, GRBs are just the extreme case, and most jets should have much higher Lorentz factors. Um, so it's not really a, yeah, that, that's kind of the, that's the order of the reasoning. But then if it turns out they're all clean, that must mean there's something fundamental to this. So maybe, you know, as the jet's going through the star, it's sort of self, the way that it self collimates is also the way that it prevents stuff from getting into it. That would be one, uh, one argument. Thank you for your time.